But when I got into Wall Street, I had 12, 15,000, which was a lot saved, you know. I started investing it. And in 61, the market was hot. And you never really, I've learned, I learned a lot from that because you'd never confuse a bull market with brains. And, and what, what I did was confuse it. And I'm buying all these stocks, I'm picking this and I'm picking that. And I had a following of people who would listen to me. Oh, wow, well, you can, but everybody was making money. You don't realize that. And Jack Drivers would tell me, he'd come over. He'd sort of like me, he'd sit there with me once in a while. And, and he said, you're gonna lose every penny you have. I'm telling you, Carl, before you're through it, he said, I got this. I was up to about $70,000, which wow. was huge. A lot he of says, money back he then. says, you know what? When this is over, six months, a year, maybe less, he says, not only won't you have the 70, you'll be negative. Everything you ever had. And he was right. In three days in 62, they cleaned me out. I was, I was, and I learned. I tell you what I learned from that experience. You didn't learn from him just giving you the advice. You had to go through the pain. You had to go through the pain. You have exactly. to go through it. The market is not a gambling casino, and too many people, in this type of market, too many people think it is, and especially now with low interest rates. So it's really a dangerous place today. How'd you build yourself back up, though, after the cleanup? Well, then had a few bucks left, very little, and I said I got to learn something. So I read a lot about puts and calls, and in those days, that was really the Wild West, the puts and calls. And you had all these option brokers, if you remember, and they were fleecing everybody. So I was the honest broker, so to speak. I'd come in and tell everybody, so put out make, a midweek option report, market. and I'd stay up every night calling people that write in for my report. And I'd be calling them from Cal to California. And I've had a big following in options. And I'd give them more than they thought they would get, which I couldn't believe. Here's a guy that I don't know from New York calling these, this wealthy guy, and he'll sell, sell 10 calls on this stock, and I'll do it for five grand. I get him six grand. The guy couldn't believe it, right? Then I get him more. And the put and call brokers couldn't believe it because they all wanted to give your business back. They said, I know you can do it cheaper cause. And I built this thing up. By 68, I was making seven, 800 grand a year, which was uh, like oh, today, million. 10 million, 20 million. Where did the drive come from? Like, where, where I, I always had it. You have to really have an obsessive nature and whatever it is you want to do, you want to be a great tennis player. You know, there are guys that are more talented maybe than McEnroe or something like that. Maybe his brother, they say, was more talented, but McEnroe worked at it. McEnroe loved it, I guess. He was obsessive. He worked all the time. I mean, if you think so about brains, any of these brains guys. brains is not enough. Talent's not enough. Talent's right? not it's enough. Drive, you got you to do both. Well, you had this great options business. And when did you start thinking about not just being yeah. an investor, but somebody who Well, I, I wasn't an investor. I, was, I had this big following. And so I got the money. I had an uncle that had some money. And I, by that time, had saved a couple of hundred grand. You could buy a seat for 400. Mm -hmm. He loaned me 200. So I had enough without borrowing. I didn't go to borrow that. So we had 600. And the interesting thing, when we worked out the numbers, my, I never forget, my uncle's accountant said, you're crazy to do this. You're making yourself five, 600,000 a year. No matter how you do this, with the income you're gonna make from the commissions, but you got your own seat now. You gotta have accountants, you gotta have lawyers, you gotta have overhead. There's no way you can make a penny. And he told my uncle, he said to him, look, you wanna loan him 200, you're not gonna lose it. He's putting up you know, his 200, and the way it's structured, you really won't lose. And I, had, you know, I was paying my uncle a real good return on the money plus a piece of the company. But I did it anyway, I said, forget it, I'm gonna have my own firm. I realized then, in those days, in 68, 69, these guys that did arbitrage, there were only a few German Jewish firms, literally, like Goldman Sachs and some, that did this arbitrage. Jim Loeb. De Loeb actually didn't do it that much. They did merger arbitrage. But I'm talking bona fide. I couldn't afford merger arbitrage. I couldn't afford to figure one company will take over another. That's what they did. But this stuff was sort of arcane. It was mathematical. You, you bought a convertible this bond. This is the Gus Levy era of Goldman Gus Sachs. Levy did some of it. Goldman did it. Okay. And a few German, and you made a fortune from it because you didn't have to put up any real money. See, we cleared with low roads, actually. Mm -hmm. And all I had to do is put up like 10% because I'm buying a convertible bond and I'm shorting the stock. Right, exactly. Right? You can't lose literally. I mean, I'm making it more simple than it is, but you really couldn't lose. So you keep building up that position with the hope that one day the market crashes. And if it crashes, the convertible bond that converts into the stock is now a bond. It doesn't go down as low and fast right. as the stock. Right. Right. And if the stock fun. falls down, gets killed, you make a fortune. You, and I hit with it a number of times. When did you start times. taking the outside money? 
that was, um, we, we had an option writers fund then. And we always did very well for everybody. The arbitrage thing was making me literally, and I was the only guy that could put it together with options. So I shorted it, go longer. I, I, you couldn't lose if it, if it went down, you made a lot. If it went up, you sort of broke even. But if I did options, I made a lot on the upside. So I gave up the option business. I gave it to my assistants. I had two guys went over with me. They had a little piece of the business those days. Mm -hmm. I, I said, you, you keep that. And they both were making a lot of income from it. it. It pays to be ethical. I found over my life, I had a code that I lived by. You could laugh, but I had my own code. And I had a following then What's too. What's the code? Tell us the code. Well, the code is, what one part of the code, I mean, there's a few things. But one part of the code to me, and I had it inculcated for some reason, that if somebody gives you money to manage, you owe them your fealty, meaning you owe them loyalty, and that's how we built the option business. I was giving them an extra thousand bucks. It's part well, of the trust. You know, they, 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 they're entrusting with you something dear to themselves. Yeah, but what it was happening in the history, so I had these two guys, they owned a piece of the firm. You know, I don't, I don't remember how much, maybe 20%, firm 25. And the reason they left me was they had a following in the options. We had all this. And it was maybe 72, you guys, you were too young, but, but anyway, in 72, the market was hot. You know, right. the same as it is today. New issues go crazy. And nifty all these, 50. The nifty, nifty 50. 50, yeah. Crazy mm -hmm. multiples. The nifty 50 back in, in the 70s, right? In the 70s. Yeah. Yep. And these little companies were going out. There were firms that F.L. Solomon were very friendly with. I mean, there were a bunch of these firms making a fortune. My two guys were making great money. I mean, frankly, they wouldn't have made it if I weren't there. But they were doing much better than they ever thought they would do. You know, they were living in Queens. They moved out to a nice place in New Jersey, wherever the hell they moved. But... The thing is, especially one of them, was pushing like hell to do underwritings. Because we could do an underwriting, you know, this little dicky company, get into the underwriting group, and we had this big following, and we would buy a lot and make all the uh, underwriting, underwriting fees. fees, which were huge. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and these guys would have really benefited. I said, I'm not doing it. Because I'd look at the company. So when you look at the company, you say, how the hell can you sell somebody a company that makes plumbing fixtures and give them 40 times earnings for it. Oh, well, you got to understand, they got a new fixture. I said, let me, you, let's look at the new fixture. Right. Let me talk to some guy that understands that. You talk to a guy that understood, I'm just giving you an example. Let me understand the, the new fixture. The guy laughing at you, this is ridiculous. Oh, but they say it's great. They say, forget it. So they, they well, one of them said, well, I'm leaving the firm then. I said, God bless you, leave the firm. I got the stock back from the guy. Yeah. And I didn't do it for that reason. And then the other guy left eventually, so I owned the whole firm. You know, I've always found that after that, I know it sounds cynical, but you have a choice if, you, uh, if you're going into a business, you can have partners or you can have money. So somebody can give you money and take a little piece, other partner is gonna work for you. I always took the money.